House process, my assistant and I reviewed the opinions in the civil rights cases in which Judge Sotomayor participated while in the Second Circuit in the context of prevailing civil rights jurisprudence and with particular attention to the case of Ritchie versus DeStefano. Our review revealed at least three significant concerns with respect to the manner in which the three-judge panel that included Judge Sotomayor handled the case. The first concern was, as you've heard, the summary disposition of this particular case. The Ritchie case contained constitutional issues of extraordinary importance and impact. For example, the issues of, that are very controversial and volatile, racial quotas and racial discrimination. This was a case of first impression, no Second Circuit or Supreme Court precedent on point. Indeed, to the extent there were any cases that could provide guidance, such as Wigand, Croson, Adirond, even private sector cases, such as Johnson Transportation, uh, Frank versus Xerox, uh, Weber versus Steelworkers, would dictate or suggest a result opposite of that reached by the Sotomayor panel. The case contained a host of critical issues for review, yet the three-judge panel summarily disposed of the case, as you've heard, in an unpublished one-paragraph per curiam opinion that's usually reserved for cases that are relatively simple, straightforward, and inconsequential. The second concern is that the Sotomayor panel's order would inevitably result in the proliferation of de facto racial and ethnic quotas. The standard endorsed by the Sotomayor panel was lower than that adopted by the Supreme Court's test of strong basis in evidence. Essentially, any race-based employment decision invoked to avoid a disparate impact lawsuit would provide immunity from Title VII review. Under this standard, employers who fear the prospect or expense of litigation, regardless of the merits of the case, would have a green light to resort to racial quotas. But even more invidious is the use of quotas due to racial politics. And as Judge Alito's concurrence showed, there was glaringly abundant evidence of racial politics in the Ritchie case. Had the Sotomayor panel decision prevailed, employers would have license to use racial preferences and, and quotas on an expansive scale. Evidence seduced before the Civil Rights Commission shows that when courts open the door to preferences just a crack, preferences expand exponentially. For example, evidence seduced before hearings of the Civil Rights Commission in 2005 and 2006 show that despite the fact that Adirond was paced, uh, passed more than or decided more than 10 years ago, Federal agencies persist in using race-conscious programs in federal contracting, governmental contracting, as opposed to race-neutral alternatives. Moreover, even though the Supreme Court had struck down the use of raw numerical weighting in college admissions in Gratz versus Bollinger, thereby uh, requiring that race be only a mere plus factor, a thumb on the scale in the admissions process, powerful preferences show no signs of abating a study by the Center for Equal Opportunity showed that in a major university, preferences were so great that the odds that a minority applicant would be admitted over a similarly situated white comparative were 250 to 1. At another major university, 1,115 to 1. That's not a thumb on the scale, that's an anvil. And had the reasoning of the Ritchie case in the lower court prevailed, what happened to Firefighter Ritchie and Lieutenant Vargas would happen to innumerably more Americans of every race throughout the country. The third concern is that the lower court's decision that would permit racial engineering by employers would actually harm minorities who are the purported beneficiaries of that particular decision. Evidence seduced at a 2006 Civil Rights Commission hearing shows that there's increasing data that preference preferences create mismatch effects that actually increase the probabilities that minorities will fail if they receive ben uh, beneficial treatment or preferential treatment. For example, black law students who are admitted in preferences are two and a half times more likely not to graduate than their similarly situated white or Asian comparatives, four times as likely not to pass the bar exam on the first try and six times as likely never to pass the bar exam despite multiple attempts. Mr. Chairman, it's respectfully submitted that if a nominee's interpretive doctrine permits an employer to treat one group preferentially today, 
there's nothing that prevents them from treating another group or shifting their preferences to another group tomorrow. And that's contrary to the colorblind ideal contemplated by the 1964 Civil Rights Act, Title VII, which was the issue decided in the Ritchie case. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for your